forever. Dog. Yeah, it's a countdown. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the best show. The best show you've ever heard. My name's Tom Sharpling, and I'm the host of the show tonight. And we're going to have fun, and we're going to do the things we do the way we do it. And we got a good one for you tonight. We got Keith Morris. It's going to be live in studio. Off. A circle jerks. A black flag. What more do you want? Is a legend. Legend. Going to talk about the new Off album, Free LSD, which is a seriously great album. I'm going to play something from it in a minute. And there is a topic tonight. Um... Tonight's topic is the 50, uh, 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 the top 50 lists. Tonight's top, tonight's list topic is the top 50 lists you want to hear on the best show. So if there's a list, it should be the top 50, top 50 lists you want to hear on the best show. We'll keep it simple though. We'll keep it as just the top 50 lists, because maybe some of these lists should be only 20 uh, 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 things listed on them, not 50. Not every list has to be 50. Not every list is Sally O'Malley. They all don't have to be 50. But we'll get into it with the top 50 lists you want to hear on the best show and the number is 201-989-0012 if you want to be a part of the show and also we'll do this we'll take calls for keith morris i'll get a couple calls on there we a lot of times we're the guests we don't always take calls let's start taking calls for the guests be a regular larry king up in this piece huh right just do it the way Larry King did. Larry King, I'm coming for your job. Take note. Old Tommy's coming for you. I'm going to take your gig. I'm going to take it all from you. You're not going to know what hit you, Larry King. Look out. Here I come. Coming to take what's yours. Blah, 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 blah. Let's do uh, the best show theme uh, five, four, three, two, one. Best show. Best show. Best show. Keep on laughing with the radio on a Tuesday night, on a Tuesday night. When all the other days have got you down, you'll feel all right. You'll Welcome back to the best show, the best show you ever heard, and it's me, Tom, I'm the host of the show, and I'm doing my thing the way I do each and every Tuesday night, here, in Los Angeles, November is winding down, and we are in the home stretch for the 2022 calendar year. The phone number 201-989-0012. Call in to be a part of the magic. Tonight, top 50 lists 
you want to hear on the best show. Keith Morris coming up in a little bit. He'll be live in studio. Very excited about that. Good stuff all abound, all around. Right? Right? What are we doing? Oh, what are we gonna do now? Remember them. Man, phones are dead. Phones are D-E-D dead. 201-989-0012. Don't be a chump. Call up. Talk to your old friend, Tom. Talk to your old friend, Tom. And we just heard, uh, speaking of Keith Morris, we just heard something from the new Off album. Kill to be heard, and then um, the song F by Off. It's a great album. It's a really great album. So what's going on, everybody? Tom's on a great mood tonight. I'm irritated. A little crabby, perhaps, you could say. Let me look and see if we got uh I'd like to go over to the to the Twitch and see what everybody's saying because we got a fun little uh, chat going over there. And you should you should be a part of the whole uh Twitch uh chat phenomenon. Um it's fun. It's a nice chat. Everybody seems to be pleasant and kind to one another there. It is decent the way the internet used to be and will be again. Here we go. Finally, Twitter is back. Justice is being served. Um, I saw that Elon Musk put a poll up that... Uh, do do people want uh, random people using Twitter to get shocked through their computer? And then uh, it was 78% said yes. So he said the people have spoken. As he says with each thing, he's a very smart man. So he said, Vinny Vidici, the people have spoken. Vinny Vidici, random users will get a bolt of lightning through their computer, zapping their fingers. It brings them on that episode of uh, of uh, the old Batman. When uh, remember when when that they were like, "Hey, let's let everybody out of Arkham Asylum." Amnesty, amnesty for everybody in Arkham Asylum. No, seriously, Twitter sucks. I'm completely done with it i shan't share my comedic thoughts there anymore i shan't i shan't i shan't share my thoughts there anymore there is no there's nothing to be gained on providing entertainment on twitter the best show will provide facts on it, we'll say, hey, tonight on the show, Keith Morris is going to be here. No more jokey jokes because it's not a good place. And I'm taking my jokey jokes over to, what's the name of that garbage dump I started trying the last week? Hive. Well, this is just a bustling, uh, a, 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 just a just a real whirlwind of activity. I'm sitting pretty at 447 followers, which I think is everybody. I think everybody on Hive is following me. Now, this place might be time to just stop this kind of communication. Honestly, might be time. Maybe this brand of communication is over. The 
quips and the jokes and the right it here. Look, I don't need this. You know why I don't need it? Because I have this blessed show. I have this blessed, beautiful show to do uh, where I can express myself in any way or form I choose to. Sometimes people only have Twitter or social media as the only place to express themselves. And that's that's a little sad. It's a little sad. And I'm fortunate that I have a creative outlet which which I, where I can spread out and say more on it. And look, people have done I had so much fun on Twitter. Ha had. It's fine. Might be time for some new stuff. Might be time for some new stuff. And this uh it really is fascinating watching um watching Twitter die in front of us. But like deny that it's dying. It's pretty amazing. It's a very special time because Twitter is ultimately headed up by one of these smart people who, funny how he is uh, smart, but he didn't, he, he didn't start at nothing. That's always a, a, a determinator. And that shows I'm smart because I use the word determinator. It's always a good determinator when the people go from nothing to something. That's how I seize it. You go from nothing to something. That shows you how it goes. Then you say, okay, well, you did you did it. But this dude, he's making those money, what, off blood diamonds or something like that? And he's got those cars you couldn't paint. I went in one of those cars, the self-driving thing. I was never so scared as when I was in one of those dumb car, self-driving cars. I was truly terrified. Truly the worst. Has anybody been in one of those uh, self-driving Teslas? scariest thing I ever experienced. Couldn't pay me to get back in one of them. Couldn't pay me to get back in one of them. So yeah, so that's what his claim to fame is that he, uh, Ooh, he smoked pot on Joe Rogan. Whoa. And now he's just in this, quest to be liked which is the saddest thing it's just sad he he just wants everybody to just say we like you maybe if we all just said at the same time we like you you're funny then he would he would probably dissolve He would probably dissolve because he would do this, do this do like it's Spider-Man. Remember when Spider-Man was like, help in that one Spider-Man movie when uh, uh, Purple Nurple was all mad and he was like, I'm killing one out of every two. I'm killing one out of every two. And then Spider-Man's like, I don't feel good. Purple Nurple's turning me into dust. Yeah, that was it's a good movie, though. Good movie. Good movie. Fun movie. And then when they all came out of that swirly thing, I never saw a theater go nuts as much as they did. I wanted to break through the screen. I was going to actually do that at one of the showings. Go behind the screen. When that happened, I was going to crash through. And they'd be like, hey, that's the guy who got cut out of the Ant-Man movies. He actually is in the MCU. It's a guy who's been cut out of three. Three Ant-Man movies. Three. Cut out of three. It's fine, though. Don't want to be in them. Hello, Best Show. 
Hi, is it Tom? It is. To whom am I speaking? As is Mike in St. Paul. Mike in St. Paul. How's it going in St. Paul tonight? Snowy. Very snowy. Snowy, eh? What kind of snow are we looking at? A real heavy snow? Real heavy snow? It was heavy. I had to bust out the the snow blower. It snowed from like, I don't know, six in the morning till six at night. So wet snow? Yeah. Is it a wet it's, snow? It's heavy, heavy wet snow, yep. Is it wet? Yeah, decently, decently wet. Well, I hope you're enjoying it at least. How 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 much snow did you get? Like six inches, I think. And yeah, I'm enjoying it because everything we got a good snow, then everything melted mm-hmm. and just was gross and brown for a while, and then uh, snowed again. So if it's I don't know for me, if it snows once, I want it to stick around till spring. I don't like the the gross melt mud and dead grass. You don't. Maybe. My favorite snow is when no. it snows and then it doesn't melt and then it turns into dirty ice and it stays there till April. <laughs> and then you go through like a Target parking lot and somehow there's like a 35 foot stack of snow from when they plowed their parking lot and it hasn't melted yet. When well, it's like late April yeah, and you're just like, the- when's this thing going to melt? Are you talking about like the big dirty mountain? Yeah, the dirty ice mountain. Yeah, my mom is adamant that if you're enterprising enough, that's where you find like all of the parking lot dropped treasures throughout the whole winter. They all get plowed into that ice mountain, and you can go out there. and I don't think she's ever done it, but yeah. So I got look. Thanks, anyways. That's where that's where you find all the look, chains, I'm not gonna, all the uh, keys, anything. Okay, anyone okay. Dropped. Look, I'm not going to disrespect your mother. Not going to disrespect your mother here. She didn't know she's talking about this. Until she goes and gets a pickaxe or whatever, a, uh, a jackhammer, and she proves the things she gets from it. No offense to your mommy. It, she don't know what she's talking about. It could be a good Staten Island garbage rats. Staten Island awesome. garbage rats would be good, but... It, 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 I feel like we might be looking at a new show called uh, Mike's Mommy. And uh, well, what what's your mom's name? Well, you have to call her my mommy. <laughs> her name's Deb. Bev. Deb. Deborah. Deborah. What about this? Uh Deborah and Mike colon. Snow pickers. <laughs> and you're the snow. We'll just call it snow pickers. We'll just call it snow pickers. Snow pickers. Minneapolis snow pickers. And it's you and Deborah. <laughs> you get pickaxes. You get jackhammers. You get blow torches. You and your mommy go to different Target parking lots and see what you can get in the pile. Would you I, do that? I like it. Would you do that? Um, I would. I would watch that. I don't know if I would want to do it. Oh come on! <laughs> you don't know if you do it. You really don't think you'd do it? Go go dig through the the dirty ice mountain. Well, you're following your mom. It's what you're. Uh, yes, mommy. For like a cracked iPhone. <laughs> like oh, look, it. you're following mommy. The you're the, mommy's telling you what to do. Yes, mommy. No, mommy. Mommy's the boss on this one. Deb. <laughs> you tell. You, the, 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 we're, she's not there, is she? I'm assuming you're not there with your mom. No. No, she's not there. Okay. She's not here. Okay. Well. Would she ever be amenable to calling in? Oh, she probably would. She, do you want it to be called the snow pickers or the snow vultures? I like, uh, that's tough. I like snow vultures. It sounds cooler, but 
no pickers maybe is is better because it's kind of like american pickers that's true and maybe we're, we can't finding, do it then maybe we treasures. can't do it those american pickers guys they do not like each other from what i heard <laughs> that's what I've heard. did you hear that the one guy um, looks like one david steinberg not, not and nice. the other one looks like uh 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 tim the tool guy's buddy on uh on uh, home improvement right they don't like each other no, would they, would they argue the over an old coca-cola sign Shh. would they argue over an old coca-cola sign a little tug of war over uh of a gas station logo an so sign yes. Yeah, so those gas station logos are like oil cans. Yeah. I tell you, the window to operate with that is uh, this big before that stuff. It started off crap. It becomes collectible. And then it becomes crap again. You got this much room before that stuff is crap again. An old oil can. No, this is an oil can. It's different. The logo's different than it is now. Okay. Doesn't mean I want to pay $80 for it. So, Mike, what do you got? You got something for the topic? Yeah, for so for top list. I don't know. Did you ever do just uh, like the top 50 dogs? You mean like dog breeds or famous dogs or what are we talking? No, like, like fame. Yeah, I'm thinking like famous dogs. Well, that... That goes in at number that goes in at number nine on the top fifty and then, lists. The top top fifty famous dogs goes in on the top fifty lists. Top fifty list. And then the other one I was thinking like was, name a fame name a dog name a name a name a dog who'd be on that list. Um. Hong Kong Fooey. Hong Kong Fooey? Uh, problematic much? <laughs> That's the first one that came to mind. Hong Kong Fooey. Yeah, maybe not on this list. Move that down to number 33 because of that terrible <laughs> first thought. Mike is stress testing his own idea, and we're showing the weakness right off the bat. 33. Number 33. From oh, nine, you were in nine. Be, you were in nine. Now you got 33. There's got to be better. There's better ones than that. But somehow I'm, I'm drawing a blank when there's so many. And the only other one, the other one that comes to mind is Eddie from Frasier. I knew you were going to say Eddie from Frasier. Move it to number 43 now. This guy's, this guy's <laughs> about to slide off the board with this topic. 43. 43. So you went from nine to down to 43 in no matter of three minutes. I don't think you should let my poor, my poor pick, you know, outrule your initial judgment on this. I think it's still a good topic. I might not be performing well. I I thought I was just giving topics. (laughs) Yeah. Remember when he was like, Eddie, right? No, you don't. I just remember it. Right. Not- you got to go. You got to go, my friend. Hello, Best Show. Hey, Tom. Hello. To whom am I speaking? Hey, Who Harrison? is this? Who is it? Harrison. Harrison Carter. What's your name? Harrison. Carter. Harrison, Harrison. Carter? Right. Harrison. Yeah. Don't give your full name. It's not the army. What? It's not the army. What can I do for you, Chief? I've got a I've got a topic idea. Yeah, let's hear it. Top fifty most forgettable cartoons. This the you're on to something. Give me an example now. Oh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot. There's, there's been a lot recently, or just like back then, like 90s. 
I can't. I, I really can't name one right now. Then get off my phone. Take that off the board. It doesn't go anywhere near the board. Guys, like, I got a great topic. It's so many options. I can't name one. Hello, Best Show. Hey, Tom. Hey, to whom am I speaking? Hey, this is Joe in Colorado. Joe in Colorado. What's going on, Joe? Hey, just listen to the best show. Um, I really enjoyed your your swap with Tim recently, Tim mm-hmm. Heidegger. The old switcheroo. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Did you enjoy Office Hours? Did you see me on Office Hours? Oh, yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, you really killed it with the uh, sound collage at the end, especially. Oh, thank you. Thank it you. left You're us sweet. wanting more. Well, you'll get more. You'll get more. You'll get more. Next time we do a sound collage, maybe you'll get a little bit of this. Right? Hadouken. (laughs) Uh, I can't wait. Maybe if you're good, you'll get a little bit of this. That might be in the next yes. one for you, Joe. Nardwar. Maybe I'll Love start it. doing the thing like Nardwar like uh, versus Tom Sharpling. Look, I would go. Uh, I've I know Nardwar a little bit. Never met. Never been face to face with him. We've emailed. We've chit chatted. He's a very nice guy. He's, he's actually a hero in his own way. And nobody can oh, lift yeah, my spirit. What's that now? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I've been watching Nardwar on Twitch. Uh, yeah, I saw his uh, pushing you on uh, ICP uh, unsuccessfully. But <laughs> Tell Nardwar to get uh, to get me on. Uh, tell him to get me on. About it. You grew up in New Jersey. Does this mean anything to you? And just pulls out a piece of pizza. Sharpling, why should we care about you? Who are you? I'm Sharpling of New Jersey. Welcome to the show. You're Tom you Sharpling. We have to know these British things. Columbia. Yes. I love when he gets like, well, he's on with somebody and they're just like, how do you know this? And he goes, you're Tyler, the creator. We have to know these things. You're Billy Eilish. We have to know this. So, Joe, what do you got for me, buddy? Well, yeah, I just called. I had a couple potential lists. I wanted to pitch, and then I'll get out of the way. Let's hear it. Um, one list is uh, top 50 best piles. Piles, like Gomer pile. Yeah. No, like a pile of something, like a pile, like a leaf pile. Yeah, yeah, that would be an example. I don't know if that would make the top list. Give but, me five, just so I can oh. see that this one has legs. I'm intrigued, but I want to make sure this one has legs. All right. Well, you've got like a pile of money would be great. Pile um, of money, sure. Say a pile of mashed potatoes. Pile of mashed potatoes. That's true. Um, pile of warm laundry. Something that I thought about was good. Joe. Um, Joe. Yeah. Number thirty-one. Top fifty piles. Yes. Yes. Thirty-one. I love it. You did I only it. have one more potential list. What do you got? Um, top uh, 50 or top funniest pro athletes or sports figures. That ain't no funniest. top 50. Some of the, who are the yeah, funny, give, me, not, give me mean, some funny athletes that aren't Charles Barkley. Um, well, 
Yeah, one I was kind of wondering about uh, is was Yogi Berra funny, or was he just like a dope? The first, the first dimwit that like people didn't know people bit. were making fun of behind his back. Okay. Like, okay. He was Yogi Berra had a wit about him where he'd say like the thing was so long that it had to be short. Let's pull up some Yogi Berra uh quotes. Let me pull some Yogi Berra quotes. I always wonder I wonder if Yogi Berra was mad that Yogi Berra started calling himself Yogi Berra off of Yogi Bear. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yogi Berra with, uh, quotes. Here we go. The fifty greatest Yogi Berra quotes. There's a top fifty. It's like deja vu all over again. Right? Yeah, I think callers could probably come up with like off the cuff, like fifty greatest yogi bear quotes that he didn't actually say never answer an anonymous letter you ever said never answer an anonymous letter yeah these quotes are troubling actually these uh i think yogi bearer that he could have been the he could have been the villain in seven when you look at some of these quotes like this is the mind of um, a maniac (laughs) a maniac says these things It's the kind of thing a maniac says. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I think. Well, yeah. Back then, like a lot of things hadn't been said yet, so it was just like. Well, what was that character in called in in uh, in Seven again? What was his name? The one that Kevin Smith played. I didn't see Seven. I never saw it. Any of the uh, B- best show uh, crew know the name? Of the character Kevin Smith played, the villain in Seven? Pat, Dudio, Mike, anybody? Andrew? Kevin uh, Smith? They only know him as John Doe, actually. John, I don't believe we know his real name. John Doe. John Doe, okay. The villain. Kevin Smith played a pretty creepy villain in that movie. Kevin Smith? Yeah, Kevin Smith. You've seen Seven. Kevin Smith of Clark's Three. And One and Two. Just picture him saying, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. (laughs) And then you open a box and there's a head in it. Top 50. I don't want to put that one on the list. I'm not feeling that one. Okay. That's all good. Well, I before we throw it off the list, Trevor... I'll just say that that honorary last place on that list would would go to Dwight Howard, in my opinion. Oh yeah, no, he's terrible. Dwight Howard is so unfunny. Dwight Howard. Yeah, you could probably make a better. Drives me. You could nuts. probably make a better list of of athletes who think they're funny. That you know, yeah, but that really would be awful. that would be all of them. Well, that's why they throw the ball around. Rolling the ball, right? Rolling the ball to you. Rolling the ball. Rolling the ball to you. Thanks for the call, Joe. Rolling the ball. That's a good song. You like that song? Mike, you like that song? Studio, you like that song? Is it I'm Jeff familiar with tall? that one? What's that now? Is it tall? Tall. Oh, Jason. <laughs> what is it? Oh, Jason. It sounds like skating away. Bless, bless your skating. heart. Skating. Well, who does that? Bless your heart. <laughs> oh my oh. God! You hit you hit me with a southern insult. Oh, Jason, bless your heart. <laughs> oh God, that hurts. <laughs> Mike, you know who says, rolling the ball. Oh, Jesus. Rolling the ball to you. A tool? Is it tool? Tool. 
<laughs> oh, Mike, bless your heart. <laughs> Pat, don't search it. Okay. Rice. I, <laughs> bless no. you, Pat. <laughs> Rolling the ball. What is this? Oh my God. I can't believe this is this is the crew I put together. I <laughs> can't believe this. After all this time. Rolling the ball. Rolling the ball. <laughs> did what? did something happen? What is do, do you, you know, know this? Pat, who sings rolling the ball? Rolling the ball to you. <laughs> I, I need to hear more. I can't even tell. Nobody in the chat has said it. Someone said it's Tool. I did. <laughs> I said it's Tool. It's Kate Bush, guys. Oh, um, they, there they now they're saying Kate Bush. Rolling the ball. I only know that's that Stranger Things song. Yeah, that's the so. one called Stranger Things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stranger Things. <laughs> Rolling the ball. Um, to you, Tom. I, I, I got it. We've got a call on the line that I, I think you, you need to go to. Uh, John Cale is on hold. I'm sorry. John Cale is on hold. John Cale. Yes. Oh my God! It it, it, it seems it seems real. It it seems legit. All right. Um. This is mind blowing. Yeah, put him through, please. This is exciting. Okay. Hello, best show. Oh my god. Oh, oh my god. Tom, I'm so sorry about that racket. My my wife liked classical music and she must have seen the hot tub alarm uh, <laughs> to this dumb local station that plays plays classical. I guess she said it to it. I, I don't know. Sorry about that. <laughs> Crap. Wow. John Kale. Wow. Oh. Are you there, sir? Hello? 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 Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Oh, yeah. So, sorry about that. John Kale. Wow. How are you? I'm 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 good. I'm just, I, I don't know why what are to you say. Acting, why are you acting so weird? I'm, I'm kind of tongue-tied right now, to be honest. Well, why? I'm just a, I'm just a guy. You're John Cale. Y yeah. And that is meaningful. How do you know about me? You're a legend. What? Yeah. Yeah, you're you're John Cale, VU, all the all the stuff. Oh my God. VU, what's that? The Velvet Underground. Oh, oh. Oh, no, see, my my real last name isn't Kale. No, uh, my friends gave me that last name because I, I hate the taste of Kale. My real first name is John, though, yeah. But my last name, it doesn't really uh, roll off the tongue, so that's what they call me. 
Okay. Okay. Well, this is. Wow, I never crashed. I never went on a thing. I never went from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows on this one. Oh, oh I get it. I was like, God, how does he know about John Snorkelforth? <laughs> your name is your last name is Snorkelforth. Yeah, it's weird. It's, okay, uh, it's S N O R K L E F L O R T H E. So. Yeah. Okay, well, I can see why it might be easier to go with John Kale. Yeah, yeah. You know, snorkel- a lot of people love the taste of kale, but to to me, it tastes like I don't know the the rotting carcass of a ten week old whale that's been simmering in a broth comprised of fetid hip waders that were worn by a squadron of already filthy sewer workers, combined with two hundred recently dug up wet powdered wigs from the seventeen hundreds. Uh, and the exhaust of a 1975 Oldsmobile that runs on 20 year old egg salad. So yeah, kind of not not my favorite. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like it. Doesn't no, no. doesn't sound like it. Yeah. Hey, so who did you think I was again? Who's this? Who's this? Uh, this other John Cale? <laughs> He's a musician. What was he in? He was in a band, The Velvet Underground. Oh, you mean the guy who produced the first Police single? Yeah, I believe he did. What else did he do? He put out a numerous great solo records. He produced um, the Stooges and um, Jonathan, R- the Modern Lovers, Patty Smith. He's just a legend. Oh, okay. Yeah, I kind of just know about the police and stuff like that. I, I'm a total police head. I, I've got like 32 police concert jerseys. You want to see them? I would like, I get, I mean, not really, but I'll, I'll oh, that's okay. exciting though. 30, how many? 37? 32. Oh, you know, I know I feel like it's not enough. I have 32. You just said 37. Okay. You have 32. Okay. Well, 30 in anywhere in the thirties is impressive. Well, now I want to get five more. Well, you if you buy five more, then you'd catch up to my mistake. I would, yeah, I would. You know, but I, I like any song that can combines you know rock and exotic forms of music. Like, um, I don't know, the reggae part of Thirty Eight Specials, "Caught Up in You," um, the ska part of Rush's "Spirit of Radio," Lucky Lair's samba drumming on the Circle Jerks' "Back Up Against the Wall." You know, the foundation of what we know is world music today. Sure, the. The, 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 yeah, the, 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 the foundation for world. I never thought the 38 special would get mentioned in the discussion about uh, cross pollination and world music. Oh yeah. Yeah. They were the first band to really bring those upstrokes to Southern rock. They think they, they might've been the last also. I think so. (laughs) I think so. Oh, Hey, speaking of, uh, 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 the Circle Jerks, I know you had the legendary Keith Morris on there t- tonight. Is that correct? That is correct. He's going to be in studio in a little bit. Okay. Okay. I, I have a question if you could if you could relay this to him. Sure. I'll, I'm ready. Something I've always wondered about. In the decline of Western civilization, the film. Yeah. During the Circle, during the circle Jerks set, Keith yells, hey, you pick on guys smaller than you at somebody. And it looks like he's saying it to Roger the bassist which I think is kind of funny, like he's berating his own band member on stage. And I was just curious if, if that was the case. If you could ask him that, that would be, be great. And um, if that's not interesting, I was curious about Chris Poland from Megadeth playing in the Circle Jerks for a bit. Um, I know that would be of interest to you since you're a flagrant metalloid. So is Chris Poland from, from Megadeth? Yes, yeah. Okay. He wore a fanny pack. Uh, in the photo I saw of him playing with them. So that's, that's a whole other layer to this. Yeah. I guess there is a whole thing of how many, he, there's not a whole lot of fanny packs in rock. No, no. Uh, or all music for that matter. No, no. I think it was like something you wore back in the day in the nineties. Uh, and then you would unstrap it when you got up on stage. So, you know, people could just see your, uh, see the, the long board shorts you were wearing without any uh, obstruction. Sure. Nothing's blocking the view. 
Yeah, yeah. Or in the case of Living Color, your wetsuit. That, um... It's a night of of firsts. 38 Special were the first band to incorporate reggae into Southern Rock. Right. And Corey Glover? Yes. From Living Color was the first singer to incorporate uh ocean wear into into uh contemporary music that's right can you tell me how axel rose fits into this uh conversation i can't he was the first singer to wear a catcher's uniform on stage very interesting yeah. So he wore a catcher's uniform. He did. But Elton John would dress like a batter when he would play Dodger Stadium. That's right. Yeah. And my understanding is he borrowed that uniform from Steve Garvey. Steve Garvey was so good. Not Steve Garvey from the Buzzcocks. Uh, Steve Garvey from the Dodgers. He was so good that they let him wear a sequined uniform that season so so that was not that was not a uh an out a, a, a uniform that was enhanced you're saying that's no, actually he, he got it straight out of out of the uh out of, out of the um dressing room yeah the dugout that is in i did Locker not room. know that that i did not know yes. that steve garvey wore a spangled dodgers uniform for a whole season i'm a teacher I, tonight you are. Hey, um, now I'll, I want to get some some info from you. Um, uh, a recent caller asked you a hypothetical about. It was really interesting. It was if you would thoroughly embarrass yourself in front of your heroes, if the other ninety percent of that of that experience went great, and you said no. I did. I remember. I said I did. That was uh, a week or so ago. I said no. Well, I, I wanted to, to chime in on that because, um, you know, sometimes that extreme embarrassment can be a total rush. There's actually a medical term for it. What What is the medical term for that? It's called mortification addiction. And I've been diagnosed with an ex- extreme case of it. Of mortification addiction. Yes, it, it's a little bit like what your good time buddies, the impractical jokers do, but I actually crave the embarrassment o- o- on a, Tom, can I say the word visceral? You just did, and it sounded pretty good, so you can say it again if you if you want. I crave it on a fucking visceral oh, level. You didn't have to slap a curse in front of it, but that's... Oh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. Oh, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I won't do that again, Okay. 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 Um, well, I had that addiction and basically what I would do is, is I'd find out where a famous person was going to be. And then I, I'd wait until I I was, you know, I was kind of in their, in the vicinity and then I'd run full speed up behind them and I'd toss myself a pass with a football I was carrying and I would crash right into them. Wow. That is, yeah. And what's the what's the thrill with that? Well, we'd be splayed out on the pavement, you know, and, and the, you know the famous person would be absolutely furious, and, and I would just plead total ignorance. Oh my god, I was just playing catch with a friend. I didn't even know you were here. I'm so sorry. And needless to say, the FP was furious, and I would just I would just soak it all up. I I, I know it's not normal. It's. Those are some pretty intense uh, uh, urges running through you. I know. Wait till you hear some of the people that I did it to. Oh, I would love to hear that. Uh, you don't want to know. No, I, please, please. Uh, John. Are you sure? Yeah, I would love okay. it. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, Dan Quayle, uh, Nadia Comaneci, uh, Todd Rundgren, or Reynolds, Zabig New Brzezinski. Ram Das, Don Most, Nika Brzezinski, Mark Brzezicki from Big Country, uh, Muggsy Bogues, Mark Helgenberger, 
Tim Allen, uh, Nikki Six, George Kennedy, uh, the Dalai Lama, to name just a couple of them. That is that's a wild list. Crazy. That is a Crazy. seriously wild <laughs> list. It, 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 yeah, and yeah, you know, of course there'd be a crowd with the person, either minders or fans or bodyguards, and they would be just as mad at me. I'll tell you, man. I have been beaten with everything from traffic cones to a full Thanksgiving dinner. Because you do these things. Yeah. Yeah. And the crabbier the person's rep, the more I had to do it. Like who are some of the big gets in that then? Well, uh, Bob Dylan, uh, Van Morrison, Richie Blackmore, Buddy Rich, he was brutal. Uh, Lydia Lunch, Charles Bronson, Val Kilmer, Alec Baldwin, Margaret Thatcher. She beat the ass out of me, too. Hey, uh, Tom, I hate to interrupt. Um, Yeah. We have the the real John Cale on now. He's waiting on hold. The actual John Cale. The John Cale. Velvet Underground John Cale. He has a Welsh accent. Welsh as can be, line four. Um, hmm. Well, look, he's a hero of mine, but I think I'm gonna stick with this John Cal. This, this is, this is more interesting to me. All right. Thank you. The please tell him thank you for checking in. I will. I'll pass it. I'll pass that along. That would be nice. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd rather hear more of this. Well, I'll I'll tell you one thing. You haven't lived until you've had Charles Bronson stripped to his sleeveless undershirt, holding your head between his bicep and his forearm while he wails on the top of your head unmerciful. Oh, my God. What a rush. It was a rush to, to have that happen, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that that whole thing got a little too dangerous. So I had to start a new and much safer hobby. And what what hobby would that be? Now I just fly drones into famous people. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, my God. They hate it. But I got to know who. Well, (laughs) uh, look, uh, I'm going to say this point blank. I, I fully and completely condemn you doing that it's that's despicable hmm. but well, i never thought i never thought of it that way but, but i would really want to hear who you've flown a drone into okay uh gosh off the top of my head uh it's a pearlman uh sigourney reaver Reaver, <laughs> I, I did fly into the into the band the Reavers. Um, uh, Adele, uh, Carmine Apice, Tom Hanks, Jimmy Kimmel, Blake Shelton, Vinny Apice, uh, Brian Williams, Lil Zan, Lil Baby, Lil Nas, Lil Dirk, Lil Uzi Vert, Lil Munchkin, the current Alpo dog, uh, Brian Cranston, and uh, President Biden, to name just a few. My God. Yeah, it's weird. And how hard does the drone hit them? You know, pretty hard. They're flying it like, uh, I don't know. Like, you've seen like literally every episode of uh, of aerial American cities on, on National Geographic, right? You've seen that show where it's just nonstop aerial footage of, of, of towns and cities. They're, they're going pretty fast. It's pretty fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And... With this whole, uh, is it like crashing? Where is it hitting them? Um, I try not to hit the head, but sometimes that you know I, I can't control it. But it's usually in the upper or lower haunch area. Oh man, that just like I was gonna say, I was gonna say, hit him in, at least maybe just hit him in the back if you're gonna hit him anywhere. But that might be the worst spot. Yeah, yeah, like it would be like getting shot. shoved by it. True, true, true. You should have seen um, little Dirk when I did it. He went flying. When you, 
you hit him with the drone and Lil Munchkin, you yeah. said it's the, the current Alpo dog. Yeah, I, I felt really bad about that, like as it was flying towards Lil Munchkin. So I, I kind of made it avert a little bit. So it just kind of like went between his, his legs. Okay, well, that's not bad. Yeah, it's still not good. It's not good. Well, that dog didn't do anything to me. Sure, but w- but what did Itzhak Perlman or um, Tom Hanks do to you? Well, with Itzhak Perlman, like I said, I really don't like classical music. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Sure, that'll that that's fair, but it doesn't mean it's completely your option to. You don't have to go punish him because you don't like classical music. Well, yeah, that's probably true. I never really thought about that. But, you know, I got to say, I've totally embraced my quirks. You know, I, I'm, I, I know what I am and what my issues are, unlike a certain slasher film director I know. Who, who is that? Look, he'll never acknowledge it, but it's a known fact that Rob Zump, I'm sorry, I've shown some respect. Robert Zombie cannot watch any horror movies. Isn't that crazy? Ah, uh, that is. That's that's very interesting. He can make them, but he can't actually watch them in their in their final version because he he abhors and has like a. I'm gonna say it again. He has a visceral reaction to to extreme violence. Okay. Yeah. So he really he he can't watch that stuff and. It's kind of it's kind of crazy. There's a video that you can find online of Rob Zombie freaking out while he's watching that Rube Goldberg esque scene in the 1986 film The Money Pit. Do you remember that? I do remember. Yes, I remember The Money Pit definitely. Yeah, yeah. So basically, Tom Hanks and Shelley Long buy this house, and everything is wrong with it. So they hire this crew of ragtags to, you know, to come and kind of fix and they're scaffolding up on the side. And, you know, Tom Hanks gets involved in this Rube Goldberg machine sort of, you know, thing where he just keeps falling and into things and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, in this video, each time Tom Hanks falls into like a paint vat and then springs over to another ladder where he ruins something else and then springs over to something else, you can hear Rob Zombie go, Oh no. Wait, what? Oh no. Oh my god, no, please. Oh no. Why are they doing oh no? Wow. Oh no. And then and then you can hear him just yell for them to turn it off because he can't take it anymore. So it's really That's affecting it. him. It really is. And if it's if it, he's that bad for a, like a just a romp film, imagine mm. how he'd react to, I don't know, a Trenell Strauss film like uh, a ladle full of Jennifer the Christmas guillotine or the paintball exsanguinations, right? Yeah. I, that's, I, I couldn't even imagine how, how hard those would hit him. If, if he's getting laid out by the money pit. Yeah, It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but, uh, I gotta say, you know, that, that is, it, it is kind of, it's fun to do, but honestly, sometimes being an ultimate rascal, can lead to a bit of legal trouble. Okay, how so? Well, I'll preface that by saying it's actually how I met my my present wife, Gwen. She was the judge at uh, at my trial. Your trial? Yeah, yeah. What, what, tell me more about this trial. Well, I was walking down Peppermint Street about six years ago when all of a sudden this statue comes to life and scares the S out of me. Mm-hmm. You know that thing where, where these jerks pretend to be statues and they act like it's street art and they scare you? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like they... I, yeah. Then they I just move. It. They move and then it's... I hate. Hate. So anyway, you know, I'm furious because I fell down when, when he did it and I, you know, I just kind of... I just fell down. I started rolling around because I was scared. Well, anyway, I get up and things got out of hand really quickly. And I ended up almost killing him with this flaming groovies box that I just bought. Oh, oh, okay. This is, this is interesting. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm arrested and all that, and I'm put on trial, but the, the, 
the the trial couldn't proceed because they couldn't find a single juror who didn't also hate human statues and wouldn't have done the exact same thing. They couldn't even. Okay, yeah, that that tracks. Yeah. So basically, I mean, I was it dismissed or was I quitted? Yeah, I, I don't know. But anyway, me and and Gwen, you know, we flirted a lot during the trial. You know, but basically a lot of erotic hand and mouth signals. Uh huh. Um, but after the trial, I, I asked her out, and she said yes. And I got to say, it was great. It, it, it was very intense. You know, we we did it in a lot of interesting places. I have to say. Ugh. What what? I, I didn't I didn't need to know that. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I came close to committing another felony the other day. What, what was that? Well, there's this new clerk at the CD submarine who is a total coin-operated biatch. Uh-huh. Okay, strap yourself in. You're never going to believe what his real name is, but it is Zeus. Zeus and where was this again? The the CD the CD submarine in Newbridge. Oh yeah, yeah. So, oh, so what? This guy. Tell me about this guy that. Is, this guy is like Charles R. Martin, the music scholar on performance enhancing drugs. Okay. The most judgmental, cold as ice, holier than thou, know it all bastard you've ever met. Just, just ah, oh, infuriating, right? Yeah, I get you. Yeah. He makes you he makes you fill out a six page form just so he can decide if you deserve his help. You believe that? Um, that's that's taking that record store uh, snobbery to a new level. I know. So I complained to the owner, Claude Bellenham. Uh huh. And Claude says even he has to fill out a form to get a meeting with Zeus. To even talk, talk to his own employee. Yes. And that form is nine pages long. Wow. Okay. That's wild. Yeah. So I'm furious, right? And I I go up and I, and I ask Zeus for help finding this Barracuda's reissue I've heard about. You know, I love that two and a half star power pop, right? Ah, uh, who doesn't? Wait, yeah, the stuff. It's not Tommy Keen Raspberry's big star top shelf power pop but it's not bottom of the bower power less pop like the yes the no or the maybe you know sure it's just the um it's like the power pop equivalent of kicks exactly perfect description see i knew you were a metalloid well let's see i i didn't think i was but maybe i am yeah yeah anyway so this cat zeus pretends like he doesn't even see me Mm mm-hmm and I hate when people act like I'm not there. Just ask my second and fourth wife, Sheila, right? Just acting like you're not actually there. Yeah, she used to do it to me often. And one time I got so mad, I beat up her class reunion. You beat up her what? Her class reunion. Her class reunion. Yeah. How, how do you beat up a class reunion? Ever see footage of like fairly modern hardcore shows where where there's it's just like five guys just spinning and they're just like kicking and and just like punching. Mm-hmm. I did that. It was basically it was it was during a slow dance of of that Commodore song, Always and Forever. Okay. So nobody was ready for it. Well, yeah. Well, th- that's. <sighs> John, Are you're, you mad? You're judging. I feel like the the judgment is dripping off of me. There's a like little. It. If I'm being honest, there's a little judgment here. Yeah. All right. All right. There's okay. a little. So, all right. So I get up in Zeus's grill and I'm going. You think you're better than me? I was paying way too much for nerves bootlegs at Bleaker Bob's when you were still mapping out this incarnation. It's pretty heavy stuff, right? That's that's a that's a pretty good line. It is, yeah. Honestly, I, I was so jacked on five quad espressos. I thought he was going to attack me when he turned around, and I jumped to the side really fast 
and I got my croc stuck in a rip in the carpet and I fell right into the super cute lady who just started working there. Uh huh. I was mortified. I was so embarrassed. I was rolling around. I was just sort of like tangled up in, in, uh, in price tag tape, you know, like the, the long tape. Oh, it was awful. And I, I can never face her again. And I was going to ask her out too. I, I don't know how you could face. Uh, that would be, yeah. that'd be hard. Yeah. I, and I just decided it's easier to leave my car there at the CD submarine and just buy a new one. I can't go back and, and face her. Sucks because it's a Lambo. You're leaving a Lamborghini yep. because you can't go back and get it because you embarrassed yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You'd do the same. Uh, I think I might figure a way out to get my Lamborghini back. Well, you must be really smart, Ben. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. Uh, uh, hey, you know, speaking of super cute, or in this case, semi-cute ladies, um, I didn't realize it was me and my wife's fifth year anniversary until just now. Uh-oh. That's not good. No. All the stores closed an hour ago here in Newbridge, and I met the Gus Brennan Fuel and Fudge on Tennis Match Boulevard. And I have to say, there's not a lot of potential anniversary gifts here. There's not a lot of potential. There aren't? No. Should, should I just buy buy the most expensive thing in this convenience store? That's probably a good idea, right? I wonder what that would be. Sir? Sir, what's, what's the most expensive thing in here? That's weird. What's weird? He just held up a large old cat. No, no, I mean, oh, oh, all right, uh, all right. Huh, well. So he wants to I'm sell you his cat? Well, he did, but now I'm wondering if I've ever seen my wife smoke comically huge cigars. Hmm. You know, the case looks almost like real wood. That. That might impress her for a couple seconds. Real wood is nice. Yeah. Also, they, they don't have cards here, so I'll have to write something nice on the back of this Powerball ticket. Instead of a well, not, card. How do you spell intercourse? That's not nice. I'm not going to. Well, first of all, you should know how to spell it, but I'm also not going to help you with this. Oh, she's going to be so mad. I'll tell you, that's what sucks about marrying a judge. A judge? Yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. You, you're blowing my mind with this. I know. This yeah. is. This is only, well, I, I, I'm judge, still thinking a, about you hitting Itzhak Perlman with a drone. I didn't even mention that he was carrying his violin. Well, that's even worse somehow. It, it was a strad. Okay, oh, so he's got a Stradivarius, and you knocked it over with your drone. Uh, it was worse than knocking it over, Tom. What happened? It cut it in half. Oh, that's that is worse. Yeah, you should. I could still hear the sick sound it produced of the drone just like cutting right through an invaluable. <laughs> the strings were just. Uh huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was sick. Yeah, uh, I don't like. That. Anyway, I know, but you know, I was talking about marrying a judge. That one of the bad things is that you know she might sentence you to prison if she's mad at you. You just you, you kind of live in in that fear. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but you know, it also has its good points. Like what? Well, you know, uh, I was arrested on a trip that we took to North Korea uh, uh, several years ago. Uh, for making a sick gesture at a statue of Kim Jong Il. What was it? I'd rather not reveal what the gesture was, but you would be correct to guess that it, in, it involved my hands, face, and buttocks thrusting into the statue's most private of areas. Well, that's not you. Gotta you gotta. Uh, what what what's, what are you what are you doing here? What do you mean? I'm just, I'm rapping with my good friend. No, no, right? I, I'm saying, well, a good friend is a stretch, but what are you doing with these actions is what I'm trying to say. I'm living my best life. This is really and truly your best life. 
I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty much. F- oh no. What? Oh no. What is it? Well, I guess what they say about the best show being the favorite podcast of Newbridge's most uptight and, by the looks of things, most murderous record store clerk is true. Oh no. What? What? What's going on? <laughs> It's Zeus, Tom. He, he must have been listening to the best show, which which is odd because I heard him tell Claude, quote, that clown's so out of touch, he probably doesn't even know that the Weathered Tomes is a database three side project. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know what to tell. Look, okay. well, Zeus is there. Maybe you can just <laughs> maybe you can just talk to him rationally. And oh, I can't. He's standing outside the convenience store doing that warriors come out and play thing, but with three empty bottles of four loco. Oh man. I didn't know they made that anymore. I didn't even know they made it. Yeah. That's <sighs> I don't now know. I wish I was that other John Kale. I'm I'm starting to feel the same way. I could tell you all about how I made squeeze right erotic songs for their first album that they didn't want to do okay i gotta go (laughs) are you there did he well i hope zeus doesn't uh that's troubling that is very troubling i hope i hope he's okay i hope he's okay my friend uh we're gonna play a record a record i'm gonna play a uh, like a d- digital record computer records and then we'll be in studio with keith morris let's listen to some more off right now we'll be back in a couple minutes don't go anywhere <laughs> all right welcome back to the best show we just heard few from the first off single and look i'm just gonna say this the guests we usually get usually not so hot they're usually not that good usually it's i met someone at the bus station and they were an extra on the love boat usually for us to go get a an actual Five star living legend doesn't happen very often, but it happened tonight. Because who do we have in studio? Off circle jerks, black flag. I I don't know. I got to tell everybody. It's Keith Morris. How are you, Keith? I'm good. Oh, this is so exciting. Thank you for coming down and saying hi. And it's a true thrill to have you here. Well, I, um, was talking with the gentleman out front. I know absolutely nothing about your podcast. I know nothing okay. about this show Don't except worry. you. Yeah, got to talking with the gentleman who has messed with celebrities with his football and his drone that hit Itzhak That's, Perlman in the back yes. of the head. Yeah. He didn't, what he didn't say is when he was younger, because I know him, I know him personally. Okay. What he didn't say was how he put out Sammy Davis Jr.'s eye. You know, Sammy I Davis did, Jr. had a glass I, eye. I didn't know that he that he was responsible for that. That's and that horrible. was with the hang glider. <laughs> That's the, look. You learn something new every day, Keith. And I'm just like, hey, I didn't know he took his eye out. Well, and and he he was then pummeled by Rosie Greer, who is playing defensive lineman for the LA Rams. Sure. No, you, uh, look, you're blowing my mind. I just got my blow, mind blown by him, and now you're adding to it here. I I don't know which way is up right now, Keith. I don't know which way is up. But one thing I do know, and this is a segue. You see that segue? I just did that. What I do know, there's a new off album out. I mean, it's, it's, it's so great. It's called Free LSD. Everybody loves Off. This is the fourth album, right? The fourth? Yes, it is. This album, first one in a long time. 
I went and listened to this because I thought, oh, I know what I'm going to get with an off album. It's like, I love what I get, but I kind of, I thought I knew what I would get from an off album. When I started listening to this record, I'm like, this is like crossing, it's like crossing off with a red Crayola all of a sudden. Well, one of the things that we set out to do is to toss some curveballs. Yeah. You know, because in the genre that we're a part of, mm-hmm. there's there's a certain like set of rules. Yeah. There's certain things that you can and can't do. And we got tired of all of that. Yeah. I'm 67 years old. I've been doing this like Black Flag back in 1976. Dude, you invented it. Well, I wouldn't you, go you were, that far. Not, not by yourself. You were there at the beginning, though. That is undeniable. Well, there were there were a handful of bands that helped create the genre. Sure, sure. But but to actually, when you're talking about bringing punk into hardcore, you you were. I don't know who was there ahead of you. Can you name who was ahead of you then? Nobody. Um. Just own it. You're, the, I, I, you're, you're on Mount Rushmore. I don't really uh, pay attention to that. You don't have to. I'll say it. You don't have to say it. I'll say it. Okay. You're on Mount Rushmore. Well, thank you. Um, How but, is the air up there? You tell me. I'm not anywhere near. No, that I'm. 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 Uh, that's a, a Bangles song. Yeah, from the. Uh, was that a faulty product? Yes, it was. Yeah, see, Mine. and that was uh, we were part of that record label only we were um we were on the uh f team you know there's the mm-hmm. a team the b team <laughs> uh-huh. you know you have the freshman team sure we were the junior high we okay. were getting ready to graduate from junior high that's how they okay. treated us because mm-hmm. you so let me just ask you about these curveballs because because it is hardcore punk there can be a creeping conservatism almost in a way of this is how you do it. This is what we expect from it. You don't do this. You do do this. And I, I think it's amazing for you to, to be cracking it open and adding some, some actual freaky free jazz freak out moments through the, through the record. Well, we set out to um, expand our palette different colors, Mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of it can be very black and white. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's get, it gets colorful and there might be some blue and some yellow and some red, Mm -hmm. but we, we had some other places we wanted to go. We have our typical influences Mm -hmm. like stiff little fingers and the damned and the bad brains. And we love blue oyster cult. And, and, you know, we're listening to all of this different music our guitar player and one of the main contributors, Dimitri, mm-hmm. yeah. he um, is a closet um, industrial noise freak. Okay. So now all of a sudden he has me, um, I'm familiar with all of these bands and I have music by some of these bands, but it's not music that I zoom in on. Okay. We're talking Throbbing Gristle. We're talking mm-hmm. Eisenzende Neubauten. Sure. Um we're talking, um, all, all of a sudden there's jazz influences mm. and, um, we're like watching footage of Miles Davis mm-hmm. being backed by Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters. Sure. Yeah. And I actually saw that tour, but it was way over my head because I'm not a jazz guy. Okay. My my dad was always preaching the jazz and it was like, no, 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 no. I got to listen to Deep Purple and Uriah Heep Mm -hmm. and Black Sabbath and Grand Funk and, you know, just get get very, uh, take it all the way to the primitive bottom of, to the back of Mm -hmm. the cave. Sure. Well, you're a kid at that point. You're hearing these things. You're you're there for you're there for for the seismic changes in it. Like you got to, like what was the first time you heard the Stooges? Um, I heard um, Raw Power, and was just completely blown away. I mean, mm-hmm. my mind was just destroyed. Mm-hmm. Search and destroy. Sure, it just 
And what did what did that feel like in the world? Because is it a matter of you're seeing things one way and suddenly it's like, oh my god, what is this? Is just a different set, playing by a different set of rules, all different of a sounds mm-hmm. and different attitude, and some of the aggressiveness in, in some of the songs. Mm-hmm. And I got to see them live on a uh, in the middle of summertime at the Whiskey A Go Go. Sure, and they were doing. At at this time, they would play like three or four nights in a row, and they would play two sets. And we, uh, I went with a friend. We went to the the early show, Mm -hmm. and after they, I was just like my, I I was in complete awe. It's like I've never seen or heard anything like this before. Yeah. And at the end of the first set, the two roadies had to come down the stairs. And, and lift Iggy mm-hmm. by his feet and his arms and carry him up the stairs. He was completely wasted. Yeah. It was like he was completely spent, mm-hmm. you know, and there's going to be a band that plays in 15 minutes mm-hmm. and then they're going to have to come back out and do a second set. It's yeah, like, yeah. how does this guy do this? Yeah. And that was just... The idea that these things, and look, everybody in their era gets to see things that changed everything for them. I mean, I, for me, seeing Mud Honey when that first, when the first single and, the, and Super Fuzz, Big Muff, 89, 90, I, I saw things differently from that point on. Touch me, I'm sick. Unbelievable. Like, just ra- rattled Amazing me to my band. core. Like, yes. Like, and just like, and those are the bands that are truly on the continuum, where you're just like... You run that line from the Stooges to the Sonics all the way right to Mud Honey, and it all makes sense. It um, so I everybody has their if they hopefully they have their thing that changed that made the world change for them. So the Stooges was a big one for you. Who what are what are some of the other ones where you came away saying like I'm different now? Like this is like I can't I can't see the world the same way I did. Um, I saw David Bowie and the Spiders from Mars in 1972. That's right. You, the, where the the one from the actual the live album. You yes, were... the the Santa Monica Civic. Mm-hmm. It was um, it was um, played over the radio. Mm-hmm. I, I, I want to say it was KMET or KLOS. We had two major stations at the time. Okay, and um, neither of them. If they played David Bowie, it would be at three in the morning, Mm -hmm. you know, because they were too busy playing all of the top 40s and all of that stuff. But we also had another station called KNAC down in Long Beach, and they broke ZZ Top in Southern California, Mm -hmm. and they actually played a role, like a major role, in breaking David Bowie. Okay. They also played T-Rex. They mm-hmm. also played Blue Oyster Cult. Now, I saw Blue Oyster Cult about six times. Okay. And every time that I saw them, it was just mind-numbingly great. Yeah, yeah. That's I'm fr- One of my good friends is um, Dave Windorf, who was, he was in Shrapnel and then Monster Magnet. He was the... the they just the, released a new record. They did. They, the, like, from the Vaults uh, tab, the... the 20 minute jam thing on both sides. It's amazing. I, I want to, he's going to hopefully come on and talk about it um, soon. He told me about a New Year's Eve show he saw, New Year's Eve 73 at the, um, there's a, a New York City, I'm blanking on the name of the place, but it was, um, the bill was the Stooges. Then it was, it was Kiss. Then it was Stooges. Then it was Blue Oyster Cult. And he said Blue, Blue Oyster Cult was just, you cannot believe what Blue Oyster Cult was like in that prime, that prime Blue Oyster Cult. Just favorite band. All, all the way up to the Double Live album. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that was actually the last time I saw them. Okay. And I had, like I said, I've seen them about six times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've seen them in, in a room that held like 900 people. Mm -hmm. Um, I I saw them at the um, 
Shrine Auditorium, which is most of your auditoriums hold 11, 1200 people. Mm -hmm. And I saw them right before the LAPD pulled out a uh, thing on all of the concert goers. There was the Pink Floyd played um, five nights at the sports arena. Okay. And the LAPD that were there every night. By by the time they'd arrested everybody that they'd busted, it was like seven, eight thousand people. Uh -huh. Wow. And now all of a sudden you have all of these people being busted for whatever, like drunk in public, smoking mm -hmm. pot, mm -hmm. uh, possessing a couple of joints or whatever. Yeah. Going in front of the the in in our Los Angeles court system mm -hmm. going in front of all of these judges and the judges were throwing all of the cases out. The judges got together and went to the LAPD and said, don't ever do this to us ever again. Mm -hmm. Leave these people alone. Yeah. Just rounding them up. And then but there was a period in time where you couldn't, you'd go to see a band that could draw a thousand, 2000 people and there'd be 200 people there. Yeah, because the cops would be out front mm -hmm. passing out handbills that said this space that you're going into is not a pot smoking sanctuary. OK, so don't think you're going to get away with that. Sure. And it was it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, like I saw Rory Gallagher play in front of like 150, 200 people. Mm -hmm. And Rory Gallagher was capable of headlining the Santa Monica Civic, which was twenty five hundred people. Sure. But they're scaring everybody off. They now. everybody was just paranoid. It was um Chief Davis, who was a real, when you say a pig, he was a real pig. Sure. Just a Nazi. Sure. What did it, what did that feel like, that growing, like when, when the movement, the punk moving into hardcore and then that police presence is getting more and more intense and you're in arguably the band that was public enemy number one for, for the LAPD. What what was that like to just go do a show knowing that you all had a, a, a target on your back? We didn't worry about it because at that time, Black Flag, we would take on whatever gigs we could, mm -hmm. whatever anybody would offer us, we would go and play. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, we were rehearsing four to five hours a night. Mm -hmm. And after a while, it's like, why are we doing this, guys? We're, it's like we're playing for ourselves. Mm -hmm. When are we going to get out there and take this to the public? Yeah. And because of that mentality, we'd play wherever we could. Mm -hmm. we'd, play in the, we'd play on the roof of the police parking lot across the street from LAPD Central. Mm-hmm. If there was a PA there. Sure. And and not worry about, well, we're going to get busted by the cops. It's like we never, ever worried about that. So it was just, you're just out, you're doing the thing, and where the chips fall, they fall. Right. And it's like, you just, you've got to get out there. You got to, th you got to throw it out there. You got to throw it against the wall and s see what happens. Yeah. But we were um, under scrutiny by the Hermosa Beach Police Department mm -hmm. because they thought that we were uh, contributing to the delinquency of all of the teenagers in the community. Sure. And we played at Pollywog Park down in Manhattan Beach. And that was basically our statement was, this is who we are. We hope you, we hope the, the music listening public digs what we're doing which mm -hmm. wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's uh, 2,000 people there, there's probably 200 people that are actually there because they know who we are. They've heard some of our music. They've heard us on Rodney on the Rock, so mm -hmm. they knew what to expect. And the other 2,800 people or however many people were like, running for the hills, running for their cars, throwing whatever they could, you know, mm -hmm. whatever they could throw at us. Yeah. 
What what did it feel like for you to hear your music say on the radio? What was that like to hear yourself to hear like the uh, nervous breakdown on the radio? Well, it was a real charge. It's like you know we can sit around and listen to it on the record player, mm-hmm. but now all of a sudden it's being played on the radio by a by Rodney on the Rock, who probably has he could have like. 10,000 listeners. Yeah, yeah. And he's he's the he's like the the he's like the the head figure in terms of spreading this music out and he had the disco tech and he was the he was the guy. Well, he would like Blondie. Mm-hmm. You know, he he broke Blondie, he broke the Ramones mm-hmm. because all of the other regular stations they're not going to play anything like that. They didn't play Blondie until much later, like Heart of Glass, which, you know, sold a zillion copies. Yeah, yeah. But he was he was there at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And there there are a lot of people that don't like Rodney because of some of the stuff that he's done. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's some sleaze attached to him. But you know right. what? When, when you're in a band and you're getting played on the radio, you're going to look past all of that because you're excited and your your adrenaline is ready to, like, make your eyes pop out of your face. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that. Because I, I can't even imagine. It's like so, there's so many bands where it's just like, oh, live was where you had to see it. The record didn't come anywhere near capturing it. The most amazing thing is those early, those early Black Flag singles. They, I can't imagine how much more powerful you could possibly be because those records are still like a punch in the face today. Well, they're a statement. And basically, our situation was that we were frustrated, we were depressed, we were mm-hmm. anxious. There were all of these different factors. And we had like six hours to record everything that mm-hmm. we recorded. I think we recorded f- like, I want to say, um, 14 songs. Mm-hmm. So it was like, we don't have time to be standing around trying to figure out which way the wind's blowing. Yeah. And that's where you, all that uh, regimented practicing comes back. It's it, now it's Now it's working for you. Because you're it, a machine. Well, now. it worked in spades. It was yeah. the the uh, the quote from the engineer mm-hmm. was, "They just kept coming, and and it just kept coming, and there was more of it, and it was just it just it was like a flood, you know. It was yeah. overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now it's incredibly powerful, and it's a testament to what you were doing that it's still." It doesn't feel a day old, honestly, the stuff. It feels like it could have been recorded tomorrow. Um, so with Off, because you've gone through, you've Off, you were kind of, what, about eight years on ice? We um, we had four years of our lives removed. Mm-hmm. And when, when I say four, the first two years... Dimitri and I purposely set out to spend two years writing the music. Okay. And while we were writing the music, Dimitri was also, he had stuff going on in his head where he's um, writing a script to Mm -hmm. go along with the music. Okay. And the, the lyrical content is all, he came to me and he said, Keith, you don't have to write lyrics. You've already, your lyrics are already written for you. And I'm like, well, I've, I don't, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, you've done a podcast. You've done 50 episodes of a podcast um, where all of your subject material is cons- based on conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. So we talked about, uh, Bigfoot. We talked about uh, JFK Jr. and how he was murdered. We talked about JFK Sr. and how he was murdered. Mm-hmm. And we talked about 
um, UFOs. We talked about the Philadelphia experiment where the uh, they use Tesla's power coils Mm -hmm. on the deck of a battleship and the battleship disappears Mm -hmm. and the battleship when it reappears it's like three or four hundred miles down the coast sure sure um you know a lot of these conspiracy theories when you get into them it's like i don't believe that Mm -hmm. i don't believe that there's a big foot Mm -hmm. you know but hey you know, we actually had a friend who saw a Bigfoot while uh-huh. he was driving down the road. So he called in and said, I had to pull over. And I, when I started looking for it, it was already gone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. the, the, what, what is it? The, um, not the tag champion, the uh, hide and seek champion. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> like, poof, he's gone. Yeah. Now, Bigfoot would probably but be the hide and seek we, champion. We, we, uh, in in the podcast we discussed there was a scenario where a big silver object mm-hmm. appeared over Los Angeles and it was moving very slow so you would think well maybe it's the Goodyear blimp maybe you know maybe the Hindenburg made it all the way over here mm-hmm. and it's moving very slow but the thing is the military in in their uh rush to judgment started firing upon it Mm -hmm. and did absolutely nothing to it. Sure. And the, the object went out, um, into the bay Mm -hmm. by Santa Monica and Malibu. And it turned around, it made a U-turn and it came back and it was basically, um, the way we saw this happening was it was pretty much, like challenging our military, like, what are you going to do to us? Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. nothing you can do to us. We're something that you've never, ever, ever dealt with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, and you, uh, you and your dad actually had a, uh, a sighting when you were a kid. It, you read that in my book. I did. Yes. Your book is amazing. I just let's show everybody your book. Also, this well, book thank you. is so great. My damage. It's a truly impressive, amazing story, and and it really provides a lot of uh, just a lot of context for everything. For all the music now, everything is kind of the connective tissue has been kind of put in place for me. Um, yeah, you and your dad had a sighting. We had a sighting. We were living out in Palm Desert, which is right next door to Palm Springs, out in Coachella Valley. Mm-hmm. And we had the Blue Angels, which is the Navy, the naval branch of basically the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And they would do all of their maneuvers out there. But it was the Blue Angels. And all of those jets were like, that's the Blue Angels because they're blue. Uh Uh-huh. We're we're driving down the the road. Mm -hmm. And my dad hits the brakes. And he grabs my chin and he points and he says watch that you're never ever going to see anything like this ever again Mm -hmm. and it was these silver um i want to call them dots okay and they were moving around not horizontally not vertically but in all sorts of different directions and they were moving um i'd never seen anything move that fast Mm -hmm. it was just he said, now you know what you just saw. Mm-hmm. They're called unidentified flying objects. And the thing, one of the things that we learned in our, in our uh, research is that in, in any um, desert areas, that's the reason why we've got area uh, 50, uh, God, I can't even think right now. Studio 54, Area 51. Right. Area 51 in Nevada. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I I um I gotta uh excuse myself real quick. Mm-hmm. I gotta I gotta do something because I'm a diabetic. Yeah, of course. And I drank uh two gallons of ice. You tea. do it to it. I'll be we're right not, back. We're not going anywhere. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, don't sweat it. We're good. I'm gonna take a call. Let's take a call. Keith will be back in a minute. Hello, Best Show. Hey, Tom. How's it going? Good, good. Who's this? This is Chase from Norfolk, Virginia. Chase, how's it going tonight? 
doing all right. He's finished cleaning up after my kiddos and listening to the show. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. What, while we wait for uh, Keith's return, what what do you got for us? What, what's going on tonight? Well, first of all, I have to say that yeah, you did it, you rat bastard. Thank you. I appreciate that. That means you read my book. It never ends in stores now, paperback. Yeah. Then I called initially because I had this... Uh, I was scrolling through Twitter Mm -hmm. and came across this Garth Brooks video for the song, the, uh, the red stroke. Have you seen this video? I have not. What is it? So it's like his, it's like his pre gains period, like leading up to it, but it's him in a completely white room wearing a white suit, playing a white like grand piano and then stuff just starts oozing out on him. It's the most bizarre, like absurd video that I've ever seen, but with Garth being the most <laughs> um, earnest performance. And I just thought that you would think it bizarre well, as well. Can you send it to me? I DM'd it to you on Twitter Okay, I'll check that out. your account. Okay, well, I'll check that out. All right, Chase. Chase, thank you so much. We're back with Keith Morris. Um, we were we were talking about the the hiatus for off. You said you lost four years right off the top while you were working on the kind of the structure of this of this album which is now free lsd well we took we purposely took two years to to write the music Mm -hmm. knowing that we we had no income Mm -hmm. and the 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 money that we were given to record the record we were given the money to record the record by another company that we're no longer a part of. Okay. So we had to pay them back. But um, we have two fathers. Dimitri has two kids. Okay. So he's getting by just the skin of his teeth. Sure, sure. And we had um, Mario and Steven. Between the two of them, they had three kids. Mm -hmm. And they got to go out. They got to earn a living. They got to pay their rent. They got to put gas in their cars. They got to feed their kids, clothe their kids, Mm -hmm. keep a roof over their heads. So it was like, guys, go out and play with all of your other bands. Go out and tour. Finish that record. Finish that new Red Cross record that you've been working on for two or three years. And we, we purposely set that time aside for them to go out and do what they're going to do, thinking and hoping that when they got through with all of this, Mm -hmm. that it would be time for off to do its thing. Sure, sure. And that wasn't the case. And it just, it got sticky, it got hairy, it got greasy and ugly. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we had to make some changes. But we also had... The two years where we were in quarantine Mm -hmm. with the COVID lockdown. Yeah. So that's four years right there. Yes. And because we're going through a personnel change, that's another like year and a half, two years Mm -hmm. trying to figure out who's going going to play with us. Sure. Because it's also... I'm sure it's such you need the perfect people for those slots. Like Stephen McDonald is one of my all time favorites. He's been on the show before. Um, But everybody fit in that first iteration of, of off just everybody was the right person for each slot in it. So if you're going to adjust the lineup again, you've got to get it right twice now. Well, we're, we're um, Dimitri and I are kind of depressed, okay, because we had to lose our first rhythm section, mm-hmm. who were pretty untouchable. Oh, absolutely, yeah, like two, two, like brilliant, brilliantly great players, undeniable, and 
They're just, they're not replaceable. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, we better go somewhere else. Well, that's the, that's the exciting part of it as, as, as much as I've loved off the idea that you found, uh, uh, that you have another gear at this point is really exciting that you're going somewhere with it that I did not expect. And and no pun intended getting back to we've got to we've got to add some new colors to mm -hmm. what we're doing. Yeah. Our drummer plays uh with Thundercat. Yeah. Which is a whole complete different oh, and, thing. And but the 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 great thing about Thundercat is that he and his uh brother they were the rhythm section for suicidal tendencies. Yeah. Okay. So they're no slouches. They're yeah, yeah, they're yeah. they're familiar with the genre. Yeah. And what what's the drummer's name again? I'm sorry. Our, our drummer's name is Justin Brown. Yeah. And Dimitri saw him play at the Hollywood Bowl. Okay. With Herbie Hancock. Wow. You don't just, no. you, you, that's not run of the mill. No, there's no tourists going up on stage with Herbie Hancock. Right. Yeah. You, you got to know what you're doing. Yeah, and he is a full-on monster on this record. It's just, uh, you can't believe the drumming. Well, he brings a whole different yeah. flavor, a whole different new color. Absolutely. And it's like, at one point... Um, when we're learning these songs to record them, mm -hmm. Dimitri um, would uh, occasionally step up and say, fellas, I'm lost. You know, normally your drummer keeps a pattern that uh, the bass player gets to play along with. Mm -hmm. So you've got something, if you do go out somewhere else, you've got something to fall back on. That would be... Um, the the uh, the way that I would describe that would be John Entwistle in the Who, mm -hmm. as, as as many flourishes as as much exciting, like off the wall bass playing he does. He's still solid, and yeah. because Keith Moon's just going crazy on the drums. Yeah, yeah. It's like, how are we going to follow this guy? We've got to have somebody that we can go out there and come back and fall back on to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, that's not Justin Brown. Justin Brown's doing his own thing. Justin at one point um, at, at a rehearsal said, guys, I'm not going to play these songs the same way twice. Okay. Which that's exciting. Oh, absolutely. And that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, it could be very confusing, mm -hmm. but it's, like it's like yeah. a new thing no your dad look you're you were you had training for this the whole time you didn't even know it with all the jazz you grew up hearing and maybe at the time rejecting you were getting ready for this moment the whole time i w was prepping myself i guess yeah but um autry played bass in a band called, and you will know us by the trail of the dead. Sure. And he played with them for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we were working out with another drummer who, um, blew up one day and showed some colors that we did not want to be a part of. Okay. And it was luckily it happened when it did, because if we had continued and, and learned the songs and recorded the songs and then booked a tour and went out there and found out that he's the type of person that he is, it would have been disastrous. Yeah. We would have been like right back to square one. Sure. Sure. So anyways, um, Autry, our bass player co-manages Thundercat. Okay. And Dimitri gets in a conversation with Autry and says, do you know any drummers? Mm -hmm. You know, you're a bass player. You got to lock in with these drummers. Yeah, so yeah, you know yeah. any happening drummers? Yeah. And he, the, the first name that came to mind was Justin Brown. Mm -hmm. And Dimitri was just out of his mind. Yeah. He was ecstatic. Mm -hmm. Like, can you talk to him? Do you think he would even be the, the slightest bit interested in what we're doing? When Dimitri talked with Justin Brown, mm -hmm. Justin Brown said, not only do I want to do this, but 
I need to do this because what you guys are playing will will build up my chest. It will give me chest muscles because wow. jazz drummers, they're they're all arms and they're all wrist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of flash. Yeah. And he needed to get into a situation where he was actually having to do do a little bit of pounding and bashing. Mm-hmm. That's wild. That is, and that's amazing. I'm glad you found the people who fit where you were also where you were going with it. That's a, that's amazing that you get the right players for the right moment. Um, you coming up in Los Angeles. One of the interesting things, many interesting things in your book. Um, what's your all? We'll keep showing. <laughs> there you go, everybody. Okay. Don't miss it in stores. Available, perfect holiday gift. You want something? Maybe Santa. It's a stocking stuffer. Stocking stuffer. Absolutely. And there's no limits on how many copies people can buy either, are there? Not that I know of. (laughs) (laughs) There better not be. (laughs) Yeah, I'm joking. I'll have a talk with the publisher. (laughs) The um, it's when people think when people people lose the. The idea that things are not as cut and dried. Here are the punks. Here are the new waivers. Here are the metal guys. You were. You left out. Here are the disco people. Here are the disco people. <laughs> and, but it's just like it, it, uh, the stories you tell in the book, it just is like a smear of you were hanging out with half of Rat over the years. Well, I, I kind of grew up. Um, Juan was my neighbor. Juan plays bass Mm -hmm. and extremely talented, Mm -hmm. like just like a, a a music, he he could sit at a piano and play you like great stuff on the piano. Sure. He could pick up a guitar and he could play you something on the guitar. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess he played bass because it was the party instrument. Okay. Uh, Roger Roger Rogerson, who was the original bass player in the Circle Jerks, mm-hmm. that's what he called the bass. He okay. said, "I don't, I don't, I don't want to play guitar. I don't need the extra two strings. Just give me four strings. It's the party instrument, and let's mm-hmm. get down." That's that's so 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 you're just in those circles. Everybody's just coming up, though. It's like what what like. Are you just like, hey, you're on this path, I'm on this path, but we're kind of... Well, also Don Dawkin Mm -hmm. was part of um, Juan's circle because the two of them played in a band called Airborne, which was a cover band, and they, uh, Airborne, um, had a, a, like a tiny female singer, Mm -hmm. like a real tough gal. Okay. And... They did um, like a, a, she loved to try to imitate um, Robert Plant, Led Zeppelin. Sure. Um, you know, so they, their, their set leaned very heavily on Led Zeppelin. Okay. But it wasn't the really great period of Led Zeppelin. No, you're getting more around uh, post presence, getting into in through the outdoor. Yes. Yeah. 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 Not peak. No. No. But so you're hanging out with Bobby Blotzer. You're hanging out with Don Dawkins. You're just, but but me- metal was not did not speak to you. No, I always loved metal because my my favorite bands when I was growing up. Besides the the bands that were a part of the British invasion, mm-hmm. were um, the the bands from the Riot on Sunset Strip? Sure, Love, uh, the Doors, mm-hmm. um, Buffalo Springfield. Sure, I loved all of those bands. Oh, without a doubt. I, I mean, I'm talking about '80s. What became '80s metal? Well, not let, 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 let's talk about 70s metal which leads to 80s metal yeah but um in the 70s i i'd already rattled off uriah heap deep purple Mm -hmm. and black sabbath and grand funk oh absolutely that was the stuff that i loved i loved like loud Mm -hmm. obnoxious yeah see i might be offering i might be for some reason i think of black sabbath as just being 
just a thing unto itself in my mind. And I feel like Deep Purple's the same, where they're just, they're larger than genres in a way, in my mind. That might be my own uh, weird wiring, though. You know what I mean? Like, they weren't a part of any scene. What's, like, who was, who was Black Sabbath hanging out? Like, they were doing their own thing all the way down the line, not exactly taking in influences. It's just Black Sabbath were Black Sabbath. That's a really, really great point. And it's just, that's what I mean. Like, 80s Los Angeles, you start getting into where you throw a rock and you're hitting uh, you're hitting a metal. big hairstyle. Yeah, you're hitting exactly. You're, <laughs> so that's what I mean. It's just like, look, I, I, I'm not talking about the 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 wellspring, the source. It's more just like the second generation getting into the the prime '80s metal. That was not that when they were going down that road. Were you just like, best of luck to you? That doesn't like Rat did not speak to you necessarily. Um, Juan was my friend. Juan invited me to see them at the Troubadour. Okay. The opening band was Metallica. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's the only time I saw either of those bands okay. and it was a great show. Sure. And I had a, an, an amazing time. Mm-hmm. Um, I would play some stuff that suggested punk rock. Like I played mm-hmm. the Ramones for for one, okay, and he laughed, and, and uh, I I didn't get to explain to him well, um, you know they're obviously influenced by the Beach Boys because they're more of a pop band than they are a punk rock band. Yeah, yeah. Um, now I played him Motorhead, mm-hmm. and he loved Motorhead. Sure, oh, Motorhead's the the Motorhead is the band right at the center of that axis where. If you didn't know what they looked like, you'd think they were a punk band, and then you see these these long haired guys. Like the look didn't match the sound necessarily for that era. This is true. Yes, that that that's the beauty of Motorhead to me is that they just they truly straddled the line between punk and metal or hard rock. The through that whole prime, that first, the first lineup is just, it's just untouchable. The, the common ground that I had with Juan mm-hmm. was that we both loved Judas Priest. Okay. And Juan, uh, at one time, came to see Black Flag. Now, I don't remember where he came to see us. Mm-hmm. And actually got in a conversation with Greg Ginn Mm -hmm. and we um, lost track of each other, which is real easy to do because they went on to sell millions and millions of records, which meant they would go out on these ultra mega major tours, Mm -hmm. get on the bus and go. Yeah. And they'd be, they were big in Europe and you know, this is a band they probably amongst all of their albums probably sold a minimum Five to ten million albums. Yeah, yeah. that'll pay a qu- quite a few bills. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, but he, um, when I reached, I I came across him on Facebook. Okay. So we started messengering each other, mm-hmm. and he gave me his phone number. I called him, and we got into a conversation. And, and he said, "The first time I ever met Greg Greg Ginn, because I've heard of all of the bands." I'm 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 not familiar with the bands, but I heard all of all of the names, all of the bands that were associated with SST, mm-hmm. and how he managed to skirt royalties. <laughs> yeah, and he said the the first time I met him, I just I, it, w- it was a really bad negative vibe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like he's also not alone in that. Uh feeling that way look you don't have to say two things i feel like one of the biggest travesties in is that that catalog is that for for sst is as untended to as it is is disgusting to me because this is like as great as american music could ever be and it just these these the idea that these Minutemen records are not on vinyl and you got to go pay $150 for a copy of Double Nickels and the idea that these things are just not remastered, cleaned up, 
raid the vaults for whatever's there because of that, because of ugly business stuff is truly gross to me. Well, you have to look at SST as being uh, easily one of the greatest independent labels it's exactly. of all time. I mean, if if you're listing the labels that are that if you're listing the things that make you proud to be from America, it's like Motown and SST, and these are the things that that truly are. That's the best that stuff you can get from this country, and the idea that those records are just afterthoughts and they're not being presented in a way that for the next generations to appreciate them is is terrible. Well, they just uh, re-released the Stains' mm-hmm. first album. Yeah. They just, just like maybe a week ago. Okay. And, you know, to, to find that record, if you do find it, it's, it's going to cost you like 70 to 100 bucks. Yeah, I, it's just it shouldn't be. It, look, I it shouldn't be like that. And uh, I hope I hope someday in my lifetime I see a big uh, SST black flag box that just tells the story the way it should be told. Well, we um, had a meeting of the minds that included Chuck Dukowski, okay, and Henry Rollins. All right, and. The three of us, this was something that I'd been thinking about anyways, because I'd never received any royalties. And it was like I was going to um, I was going to everybody that played on all of those records, mm-hmm. all of the varying lineups. OK. And it was like, people, we need to step up and we need to um, we're, we're, we know that we're going to have to sue to get our royalties. Yeah. Because that's the way SST operated. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, he folds his arms and his lawyer standing next to him with his folded arms. And it's like, what are you going to do to us? Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you're going to need to sue us. You, you don't send us any letter. We, we're not opening any mail mm-hmm. from any of your attorneys or lawyers or whoever's representing you. Um, sue us. Because we'll counter sue using your royalties. Mm-hmm. That's how that works. Okay. Which just, is incredibly unfair. But oh, it's that's it's, it's horrible. That's the business model. Yeah. And um, at one point, um, I had talked with the Bad Brains manager, mm-hmm. and they they were out here playing shows on the West Coast. And they happened to be in town, and it was like they were racing over to SST because they were going to go in and they were going to kick desks over. Okay. They would um, set trash cans on fire. Mm -hmm. They would raise total hell, and it would be like, you're going to cut us a check for what you owe us right here on the spot. Yeah, yeah. That's That was their mentality. And all through the them racing in the van over to SST, their manager was like, you, you can't do this guys. You, this is not the way that you do it. Mm -hmm. I had like five different lawyers tell me that's the way you do it. Um, I said, well, can't you write me a letter that, that you'll send to SST with your letterhead on it and your, your, uh, envelope with your name printed on it. Mm -hmm. And he said, they're not going to read it. They'll just tear it up and it'll end up in the round file. Sure, sure. He said, what What you're going to need to do is you're going to need to go over to USC during the football practice, you know, in the afternoon mm-hmm. and ask around and f- find the players that are not under scholarship. Mm-hmm. You know, the ones that could use a couple of hundred bucks. Uh-huh. And they're like, we're talking offensive linemen and defensive linemen who are all like 250, 295, 350 pounds. Yeah, yeah. He, he said, you, 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 you get like two or three of those guys to go with you mm-hmm. and nobody's going to mess with you because they're going to mm-hmm. see these guys and they're going to start shaking in their shoes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The checkbook might come out a little quicker. Yeah. Then. So do you think... How do you think this, what do you think can happen with that catalog? 
you you said you talked to Chuck and you talked to Henry. The idea was that we were going to get all of the black flag tapes. Mm-hmm. You know, we couldn't do anything with the Minutemen tapes. We couldn't do anything with uh, the Meat Puppet tapes. We couldn't do anything with uh, Screaming Trees tapes or sure. any of the other bands. Yeah, who's gonna do it was anyway, all we yeah. could do was focus on the black flag tapes. Yeah, yeah. And they were going to need to be, there's a process that is called um, the, the tape gets baked. Yes. And once the tape is baked, you can run it through the tape machine one more time okay. because it's that brittle. To preserve, to get it, to get yeah. what's on that tape off of the tape. And then, so now you can then, move forward with yeah. the recording. And, yeah. and, and Henry was saying, we got to like modernize this stuff. We got to blow it up. We got to bring it up to like modern standards. Absolutely. And we were all in agreement. Mm-hmm. And we, we know who has the tapes. We mm-hmm. just didn't know where he was at. Okay. Because he's been moving around to different sure. parts of the country. Mm-hmm. And so um, we said, well, that's what we're going to do. Let's get the tapes, and then we'll go through the process of being able to uh, remove the music off of the tapes yeah. and blow it up the way that it needs to be blown up. In the meantime, we need to um, get the name. Black mm-hmm. flag. Yeah. And we need to get the four bars. Yeah. And I immediately um, said, my lawyer can do that. Okay. My lawyer will, my lawyer has been dealing with the people in, in Washington, D.C. who are in charge of, well, this is who is supposed to get the name. Yeah. Yeah. You know, passing out all of these different um, trademarks. Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> He said, this normally can take two, three years, four years to get any kind of an answer from these people. They got back to him in like a month and a half. Okay. And we were all just scratching our heads. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that had happened in this meeting was we're not going to go around and ask all of the guys that played on these records for their permission to do this. Sure. Because if we did that, it would just turn into a massive clusterfuck. Yeah, then you're just... It, it, then Spinning it, your wheels. It's never going to end. Then. You know, because all it would take is would be for one or two of those guys to say no. Yeah, or somebody to think, this is my, this is my shot, I'm going to take it to get some crazy money, whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever be going through somebody's head, you just got to move the thing forward. Okay, so I have the lawyer... Uh-huh. has done been through this process okay. uh, probably at least a dozen times, mm-hmm. almost to the point where he probably has a rapport with some of the people that work in that trademark mm-hmm. office. Um, but I said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I, we need to have Raymond Pettibone be a part of this. Sure. And so he was the first person that I reached out to. And Raymond said, "Um, you guys, all of you guys, I know how my brother treated all of you guys. Mm -hmm. You deserve the name and the four bars because he, Raymond Pettibone, Mm -hmm. was the creator. Yeah. And so uh, the... Trademark people got back, like I said, and it was like a month and a half. It was like, are you kidding? This yeah, doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said the name is uh, the name was given to a Japanese clothing company mm-hmm. that I guess is now Black Flag Pants or mm-hmm. you know whatever. Okay. But they gave us the four bars, mm-hmm. which was very important in, well, in the in huge. The, yeah. Yeah. Um. It's almost like you could uh, make an album cover and put the four bars on it, and and people will know what it is. Oh my god! There's it's it's. I mean, when it comes to iconic imagery associated with music, I can't think of anything th- that pops and says what it is more than those four bars. Well, there's also the DK mm-hmm. for the Dead Kennedys, sure. and there's the Misfits horror, of, of course. Yeah, but skeleton. I'm saying those four bars. Are uh, 
it says it's an a, there's an attitude and a way of life to those four bars and a right a right to passage. Yeah. So so that's that's you're getting some you're getting to a, a a point of focus on that end. What 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 about the what about the next step with those with those tapes that got to get baked? Um, Chuck and I had uh, played a show at the Santa Monica Civic for the Golden Voice 30 mm-hmm. year anniversary. Sure, which was three nights of Social Distortion and X and the Dickies and the Vandals and TSOL and like all of the Southern California punk rock bands Mm -hmm. and the descendants played and Gary Tovar contacted um, Chuck Dukowski and said, look, man, you want to get up on stage and give a speech like what it was like to be playing back then, Uh you know, give, give all of the kids some encouragement. And Chuck said, well, let me think about it. I'll get back to you. And Chuck's idea was, I'm not going to give a speech. We're going to play some music. Yeah, yeah. You know, let's... um, He wanted to do a big rollout. He wanted all of the vocalists to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, Dezo, um, Ron Reyes, Mm -hmm. Henry Rollins, even Mm -hmm. Henry Rollins. Sure. And he, he, he wanted to play bass on some of the songs. And then Kira would be there, and she would play, like, some of the older songs. Okay. I mean, the the newer songs. Yeah, yeah, excuse the, me. Sure. And Billy was already there. Sure. We're, we're the going to fly yeah. Robo. We're going to get we're going to get a bunch of money from Golden Voice, and we're going to fly Ron from Vancouver. We're going to fly Des from New Jersey. We're going to fly Robo up from Columbia, mm-hmm. and that wasn't going to happen because okay. the, the 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 budget for the shows was already spent. Yeah. And so then um, we came up with the idea, let's just do the, the simplest, easiest thing. We've already got Billy there. Mm-hmm. And we have Stefan Egerton. Okay. Who learned to play guitar to Nervous Breakdown. Mm-hmm. That was like one of his, that was his, one of his starting points. Yeah. So we've got those two there. It's like, Let's just play the first EP and not make a big deal out of this. Sure. And it was easy for us. I mean, granted, Chuck needed to get into shape. Mm -hmm. I needed to, like, be singing the song so I knew the lyrics and was familiar with everything. You would think, well, you only played those songs a million times. You would know those songs. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. No, you got to get it's it's a it's a it's exercise. It's it's you got to be you've got to be back inside of it again. We played um, Mm -hmm. the first EP and the place. This was before the Descendants played. Okay, our rehearsal was after the Descendants got through doing their sound check. Mm -hmm. I think we ran through the the uh, five songs of. twice sure and then we played and the the whole the the whole crowd was just if there was if there were chandeliers they would have been swinging from the chandeliers <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so yeah and look all i'm gonna say please keep fighting the good fight on this because you're doing a service to the planet by saving that catalog Oh, you mean the punk rock? No, planet. the planet. Um, the planet. Well, Earth. we we had to abandon the, the plan uh-huh. because we were sued. Okay, we were sued by SST, uh-huh. and it was it got really ugly. We hadn't even approached the halfway point because the, they keep going back and forth to court. Okay, and every time our lawyer went to court, we won. Uh-huh. Uh, we. I think we won like three times. Okay. But that's expensive. Absolutely. It's expensive when you're dealing with a lawyer whose uh, fee is $2,500 an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's like big time, big shot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. And at one point he said, guys, uh, we're going to uh, stop having conversations while I'm in the office. 
Okay. You call me Saturday morning when I'm raking leaves. Okay. Call me, uh, call me tomorrow between one and two while I'm eating lunch. Sure, sure. Just so I clock. don't have to be. It's not Bill. Like all. racking all of these monetary things up mm-hmm. to the point where you guys aren't going to be able to afford this. Yeah, yeah. So uh, before we even reach the halfway point, um, the lawyer for SST came to our lawyer in a, in a phone conversation and said, I'm going to make this cost your guys $500,000 and we're not even at the halfway point. Mm -hmm. So how far do you want to take this? Yeah. And our lawyer came back to us and said, guys, um, it's time for us to start making whatever trades, whatever compromises, whatever, you know, like we had to, I had to give up um, the lyrics to Wasted. Um, I okay. I was um, on Facebook. There was a black flag page mm-hmm. where the guy that created it was going to, it was going to be taken down by Facebook. And they said, unless you have a member of the band who is a part of your site here, because you're at 900,000 people, you've been up for... Uh, about two months, two and a half months, uh-huh. and you're already approaching mm-hmm. a million people on your site. Yeah, we we have to do something about that. Mm-hmm. We we can't allow that to be happening. Okay. So he came to me and he said, "I need your help." And I said, "I'll be more than happy to put my name on this." Mm-hmm. That was one of the things that we had to give up. Okay. We had to give up the four bars. Mm-hmm. We had to give up the black flag Facebook page, Mm -hmm. which would probably be at about a million and a half people by now, if not Uh, more. Sure. And of course that page has been ruined because people were getting on there. They were uh, talking crap about Henry. Mm -hmm. They were talking, they would talk about like, who's the best vocalist. Yeah. You know, Henry or, Mm-hmm. Dezo or yeah, yeah. Ron, I think was the best. Or Keith was a, I like Keith, but um <laughs> people started getting on there talking about having seen Greg Ginn at like Coachella, mm-hmm. where he did this theremin solo that was probably unlistenable. They started talking about Greg Ginn in mm-hmm. negative ways. And so he started cutting people sure, like sure. you're, you're dismissed. Get out of yeah, here. Yeah. 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 So the, 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 uh, the last time I looked, it was down around 200,000 people. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We know what should be happening. Um, here's a, I just have a question here from a young fan named John. He, uh, he said in, in uh, Decline of Western Civilization, between songs, you're yelling at somebody on stage. You pick on guys smaller than you, and it looks like you're saying it to Roger, the bassist. Who 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 are you yelling at? The um, security guys on stage okay. were a little overzealous. Okay. And when I say overzealous, these were the guys that were there mm-hmm. thinking, I'm, I'm, I get to kick some major ass tonight. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a scene where Greg actually runs up behind one of these guys on stage and tries to kick him. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, I think if Greg would have connected, the guy would have punched Greg once Mm -hmm. and it would have been a bloodbath. Yeah. Yeah. It would have all been over. Sure. Yeah. We might not be having this discussion about getting these tapes. We'd, just have to talk to his ghost. Yes. And the the scenario is that the promoters are supposed to talk to the security guys and let them know that you're going to be looking at a crowd that looks like they're all beating each other up. Mm Mm-hmm. And you're just supposed to fold your arms and take a couple of steps back and let them do their thing. Yeah. Um, This was... This was the um, influx of hardcore. Mm -hmm. What happened between punk and hardcore was we came from the beach. Mm -hmm. 
at the beach, we're surrounded by guys that are skateboarding. We're surrounded by guys that are surfing. These are people that are just like, go for it. Yeah. Don't, don't stand around looking to sort it out and figure it out. You just jump on your board and go. You mm -hmm. just jump in the water and you catch the wave. Mm -hmm. And um, part of that mentality and part of that scene was when there were no waves and we're in the winter and it's foggy or it's raining. Mm hmm these guys that need to be on the move are, are athletes, not jocks, mm -hmm. athletes. There's yeah. a big difference. Yes, there is. The, the athletes would go up to the mountains. They'd go to Big Bear. They would ski. This, mm -hmm. was, before, this was before snowboarding. Mm -hmm. But these guys probably would have uh, caught the very beginning of snowboarding. Okay. Anyways, we have this mentality that's just, here it is, let's do it. Yeah. Let's not try to overanalyze this. Let's not, we're, this is not rocket science or mm -hmm. brain surgery. Yeah, yeah. We're just going for it. Yeah. We're letting off some steam. We're yeah. jumping up and down. We're moving around. Mm -hmm. And that mentality we we brought that up with us from the beach. You also have all of the kids down in Orange County. Mm -hmm. You have all of the kids down in Huntington Beach. Mm -hmm. And there's kids from the Valley that, you know, drive 25, 30 miles to surf if they mm -hmm. surf. But the majority of these guys, they're riding skateboards. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why there was this, this term skate rock. Sure, sure. You know, because they they started listening to ZZ Top and Deep Purple yeah. and Black Sabbath yeah. and Led Zeppelin. Yeah. And then, th then there's the germs and X. And mm -hmm. um, then there's all of the, all of the, Beach bands and the the young bands from Anaheim and Buena Park and mm -hmm. the Adolescents mm -hmm. and Agent Orange and all of these new bands yeah. and all of these new bands brought this new energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it it, it and it changed and it spread out from there and and changed everybody. It changed everybody ultimately, but this is the epicenter for it. I vote. If you want to, let's see if we can hear this. Maybe you can hear it through these speakers. You don't have to put headphones on, but you can. Uh, we have a somebody has a question for you. We have uh, Andy. Hello, Andy. Tom. Hey, you're here with me, and you're here with Keith Morris. Hey, Keith Morris. Hey, Tom. Great conversation, guys. Oh, thank you. Would Love you, the uh, new album. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, do you have a you have a question? I did. I I have a had a question for Keith. First of all, I I love his memoir and uh, I love the stories in it. And I wanted to know if Keith is uh, still friends with Bob Forrest from Thelonious Monster, and if so, has Bob forgiven Keith for destroying his Sammy Hagar and Culture Club records? Um, well, the the scenario with the um, Culture Club yeah. and Sammy Hagar, the the Sammy Hagar was an actual vinyl album that I tossed out the back door like a frisbee oh. into the construction lot mm -hmm. behind the house. <laughs> okay. The Culture Club cassette, after he'd played it, probably. A thousand times. You 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 can only <laughs> listen to that so many times. Sure. Until you want to like uh, punch somebody until their eyes pop out, or <laughs> you know you want to run somebody over uh -huh. in their in your car. Um, I got the brilliant idea to take a, a giant Ziploc bag and fill it with chocolate milk, and I took like five or six of his cassettes, his favorite mm -hmm. cassettes. Okay. And I placed them in the Ziploc with the chocolate milk, zipped it up, and put it in the back of the freezer. Yeah, that'll do it. And um, he probably um, he probably has forgiven me for that. 
uh, Bob, oh, Bob is one of my best friends. Bob um, also talks a lot. Bob also puts his foot in his mouth a lot. And it's just, that's the way Bob is. Mm-hmm. Well, wow, let's hope that time heals all wounds. And, and uh, if, if you look, we'll get him a new culture club cassette. No, if we it's won't. It's a big problem. <laughs> we'll, I'll get it for him. Yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> all right. All you, right. You've got better things to do. Okay. Fair <clears throat> enough. Now, okay. you could Thanks have so him on your show. Call. Yeah. You could have him on your show. Okay. And you can tell him that you wanted to buy him a culture club. Cassette. Sure. Or maybe I'll wrap it up and give it to him for Christmas. No, you don't even have to do that because you're not, you're not going to buy it for him because you're going to say, Keith Morris told mm-hmm. me not to buy you a culture club. I'm just going to, he's going to say to Bob from Keith. <laughs> it's going to be wrapped. He's going to unwrap it and he's going to see it's, uh, it's the Culture Club, the first album, and he's he's just not going to know what to do with himself. Coma, 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 chameleon. And that's the second Culture Club <laughs> album. Oh, so you know this. I don't. Well, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to write, I have a lot, I, we, I talked to you longer than I thought I was going to because you are infinitely fascinating and you're it's it's been a true pleasure having you here. I'm so excited about everybody check you're about to go out on the road with off finally. We start next week. Okay. And where are you going to be? Um our first two shows are at the same venue in Denver, Colorado. Okay. And then we go to Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. So we're hitting all of the snow. We're hitting the the freezing cold. Like today, during the middle of the day, it was Mm -hmm. 23 degrees. Sure. So this seems like some good timing for for you to be. For for Southern California guys (laughs) to be going out and Mm -hmm. playing. But it's that's just the way that it is. That's you know, when when you have the dates, you go and you do them. We actually had to postpone the mm-hmm. first leg of this U.S. tour, mm-hmm. which I think was probably about uh, 18 shows. Okay. Our drummer, Justin Brown, mm-hmm. who's anemic. Okay. Wound up in the hospital, and he had to have two blood transfusions. Oh, man. And it happened... A couple of days before we were supposed to leave on the first leg. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, should we just uh, cancel the first uh, five shows? Mm -hmm. We hadn't rehearsed as a band. Mm -hmm. And we're going out on the road playing these new songs. Mm -hmm. It would have been a disaster. Yeah, yeah. And there's another part to all of this. Free LSD is not only an album, Mm -hmm. but it's a movie. Okay. And Dimitri has been in the editing bay with the two other editors. Okay. And the the movie had uh, a couple of like quick edits mm-hmm. so we could we could get placed uh in Slam Dance. Okay. Film Festival. Sure, sure. And mm-hmm. hopefully Sundance Film Festival. Mm-hmm. And the South by Southwest. Those are like, those were our first three major film sure. festivals. Okay. Um, so 2023, we can, this movie yes. will be out and about? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm so excited you, you can, anybody can trip over something once. But you do it over and over and over again for decade after decade. You're a true icon, and it's a true thrill to get to talk to you like that. Like we just got to talk. Well, that's what they have plastic surgery for <laughs> when you fall on your face. And then the next time mm-hmm. I see you eating at a place, I'm not going to say where I see you. I see you often eating. I'm not going to ruin your secret spot. Hey, are you a Los Felizian? I, I have been, yeah. Okay. And I will see you. Or a Hollywoodian? Yourself. More a Los Feliz. And okay. I'll, I let you. I said, there's Keith. He's reading his newspaper. Let Keith be Keith. <laughs> just I'm not gonna not gonna bug Keith. Next time I'm just gonna go, hey Keith. 
And That's I'll, all I'm going to do. And I'll say, I'm not going to ask for any more than that. Yes, Tom, how are you? <laughs> That's And that'll be it for the next exchange. But seriously, everybody should check out Free LSD, Off, see them live. You're not going to regret it. And Keith, thank you so much for coming in. Well, um, I, I would like to extend an invitation for Ooh. you to invite me back. <laughs> oh, well, please. The door is always open. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we got a stage in the other room. Mike Watt played a few months ago when there was doing the Stooges covers. You come anytime you want to come. We've got a full setup in their performance space. Okay. The door is open. You tell me when. That that could be a very interesting scenario. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. I would I would love it. So let's play something from the new album and I'll we'll wrap the show up. And uh thanks again, Keith. Hey. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. And this is Ignored from the new Off album, Free LSD. Hey, we're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. Hey. Oh, that was amazing. What a what a total what a total treat that was. That was very exciting. What a thrill, Keith Morris. Let's go back to the phones. Let's take wait, a- Andy, are you still on the line? I'm still on the line, Ooh. Tom. That was fantastic thank you so so much oh that was so much fun ask that question yeah of course that was a great question and andy we will talk to you soon i'm gonna wrap it up uh make sure everybody gets on have a great one okay thank you i love you too bye bye hello best show hi this is sharon in los angeles sharon how are you my friend sharon I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How's it going? Good. That was really cool. I have to read the book. The book is uh, is pretty amazing. Book. The book is pretty amazing. Uh, you got to check it out. Um, yeah, I uh, I w- that was a total blast. It's exciting to get to talk to somebody like like uh, like that. And yeah, there's so much. And now I feel the same way. I get to talk to the co-host of another legend, Sharon. The co-host, your show again is? No More Heroes on KXLU. Thank you. That's right. Yes. Um, What's going on tonight, Sharon? Well, I had one for the topic. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ajax was cluing me in that maybe this has already been done as a topic, and maybe that's how I got the idea. I kind of have an example for the list mm-hmm. and work backwards from there. But let's see. Did you ever do luckiest, like luckiest SOBs? I think uh, we... maybe like a non gendered version of that. But, you know, like these people are so lucky. I feel like we've done some version of that. Um, You've done it. I think so, because I remember. I think Ringo Starr came up a lot. That makes sense. During it. I think that's one of those ones where it's like everybody's talking about luckiest person. And then so it's like Ringo Starr, Ringo Starr, Ringo Starr. So, yeah, that, but that's a good one, though. Uh, doesn't Didn't say they had to be new ones. 22. Right. <laughs> that goes in at 22. Can I give you my example? Oh, please. Yeah, this is my example. Somebody so lucky is uh, whoever played the keyboard solo in the middle of Inagata De Vida. Mm hmm. It's so funny. Sharon, I just said to Keith, um, I'm playing the song. It's one of your the off the new off album. It's two minutes and forty two seconds long. For you, that is Inagata Davida. I literally just said that five minutes ago. Wow. Well, I, I've been on hold the whole time with that sitting on that. So it's in the air. <laughs> it's in the air. Yeah. Um, but he he plays like a there's like a Christmas riff in there. Just in Inagata Davida. I forgot what it is like. Yeah, like Three Kings of Orientar okay. riff on the keyboard. So it's not. That 
doesn't happen in the yeah. uh, in the God of Davida. What happened if it was like? It wasn't, yeah. In a God of the Santa, baby. <laughs> right? Don't you know that I'm... Uh... Yeah, I don't know. what. Maybe we get the uh, Iron Butterfly guys in here to jam out. That'd be cool. That would be really cool. Yeah. Iron, get a band that has, like, the son of one original member. <laughs> right. Like, one of those bands. Yeah, totally. We're, we're still flying the flag for you, Pop. We're doing it. Everybody here, my Pop, he loved being an Iron Butterfly. And uh, tonight, this one's for you, Pop. <laughs> Not yet. And then they stop it. They're just like, whoa, we're not doing it yet. Sharon. They could play an extra long version of Anna Gata Davida. An ex oh, an extra long one. So the <laughs> yeah, the the, the version. standard version is not long enough for you. No, no, it's gonna be at least twenty five minutes. And it just doesn't stop. What if it's just a perpetual Inagata Davida machine that just goes and goes and it's powered by Inagata Davida and never stops playing Inagata Davida? Like you can't even unplug it. <laughs> no, you go once. It, once you turn the thing on, you can't stop it. It's like black. It's like Black Mirror. Horrifying. Truly horrifying. It's wow. kind of a thing though with like the '60s bands. I think where it would be like question mark of the Mysterians or something, and then it would just go into like Mary had a little lamb on the combo organ mm -hmm. or something. It's, I think it's just whatever they could play, and they're in the studio, and it's like, well, I need a solo here, so. What do I what do I got? Uh, you know, these are the problems I will never have. <laughs> yeah. Or the benefits in life. Never gonna have Inagata Davida problems. Hashtag Inagata <laughs> Davida problems. Um all right, Sharon, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, it's great to hear from you, sure. and I, I will hear from you soon. Yeah, good talking to you. Uh, Talk to you again same soon. here. Bye -bye. You take care. Bye. Everybody, we're not wrapping up just yet. I want to tell you all a couple things. Um, I have been told to read this document. The best way to support the show, which is the best show, is to sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash the best show. We've got a lot of great bonus content over there. We got so far, we got Rubenesque, and I'm just going to say this. Word has it. So far, the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young recap podcast, word has it. Everyone knows it's done. We we summed up the 50-plus catalog years for those four uh, musicians in every configuration. Um, Jason, Mike, or Pat, anybody want to say anything about the uh, a rumor that's been swirling around? <sighs> what, I mean, what, do you, what, what detail did you hear? Well, just just say what it is. Just say it. <laughs> just say what it is. <laughs> just uh, just say. Okay, it. I can't. Uh, I can't. We recorded a new so far. We did record a new so far. So there's a and new so far. Episode what? eighteen. Episode eighteen, covering all of 2022, and it's out Sunday. It comes out this Sunday. A new episode of so far. There's Ruben Ask up there. There's Ask Tom. There's going to be new things going up there over the next two months. Get ready for that. And then oh, you can also get the weekly uh, episode of the best show is uh, ad free. If you're a forever, it's ad free on Patreon. And you can also get it ad free if you subscribe to Forever Dog Plus at foreverdog.plus. And uh, 
The videos for the show are over at youtube.com slash best show for life. Um, and then we're on Twitter, best show for life. Yeah. A lot of stuff. I'll talk more about this uh, in the upcoming. Uh, I'll talk about it more next week. Um, yeah, I. I, uh, I don't know. I might ramp it up. I might wrap it up. I might wrap it up. We're done with the calls. Everybody's happy. We had Keith Morrison. We talked to him. Um, yeah, we'll we'll keep it going, everybody. Um. Thank you for listening to the best show, and uh, we'll be back next week. Bye. The Best Show is produced in partnership with the Forever Dog Podcast Network. The show is hosted by Tom Sharpling and features John Worcester, Jason Gore, Pat Byrne, and Michael Lisk. The show is produced and written by Jason Gore, Pat Byrne, Michael Lisk, John Worcester, and Tom Sharpling. The Best Show is executive produced by Tom Sharpling, Brett Boehm, Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. The show is engineered and mastered by Andrew Gleason, website and technical support provided by Martine Sellis, and the show is recorded at Forever Dog Studios in Los Angeles. Support The Best Show on Patreon over at patreon.com slash thebestshow, and follow us on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram over at Best Show for Life. That's Best Show number four, Life. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.